Welcome to Wendy's Classic Corner. I'm Wendy, and today I want to talk about screwball comedies. I want to start out by mentioning that if you missed any of our shows, you can always catch up all, on all of our episodes on my YouTube channel, Wendy's Classic Corner. You can also do a search for Wendy's Classic Corner on PCTV21.org under the Watch Live tab. If you are interested in appearing on the show to talk about classic film, please follow me on my Wendy's Classic Corner Facebook page. And now, I'd like to talk about a lesser known genre of classic film, the screwball comedy. What exactly is a screwball comedy, you might be asking? Well, let me see if I can enlighten you a little on the subject. Screwball comedies originated in the early to mid 1930s. Some point to It Happened One Night, 1934, as the first official screwball comedy. Screwball comedies were created during the Great Depression to give the public something lighthearted and amusing with escapist themes and social class critique. It is generally agreed that the classic screwball comedy period ended in 1942. These films are a spoof on love stories, with most featuring a strong, independent female lead who dominates the male lead. There is a great deal of verbal sparring between the sexes, almost a substitution for sexual tension, with which would have been censored by the Hayes Code. You can learn more about the Hayes Code by watching our pre-code episode of Wendy's Classic Corner on YouTube. It is said that screwball comedies were also created to fight against the boring morality the Hayes Code was trying to enforce upon films. Besides featuring a strong, dominating leading woman, screwball comedies may feature some or all of the following. Fast-paced, witty dialogue, silly situations, escapist themes, battle of the sexes, and a plot line involving courtship or marriage. I hope this brings you to a better understanding of the genre. Now I'd like to talk about two of my favorite screwball comedies. I'll start with a very cute screwball comedy starring my favorite actress, Barbara Stanwyck. Barbara starred in several screwball comedies and excelled in fast talk, wisecracking dialogue. The film I want to talk about is The Lady Eve, 1941. Besides starring Barbara Stanwyck, this film also stars another actor that I'm a fan of, Henry Fonda. Henry Fonda may not necessarily be known for comedies, but he is more than capable as evidenced in this film. The Lady Eve is written and directed by Preston Sturges. Preston Sturges was very influential in the screwball comedy genre and was one of the few directors that would both write and direct his films. The Lady Eve is a film about a group of con artists, Handsome Harry, who's played by Charles Coburn, and his daughter, Jean, who's played by Barbara Stanwyck, as well as a variety of associates. Jean's job is to lure rich men into card games with her father, who is a card shark, and fleece them out of huge amounts of money. They often travel on ships, engaging in this and various other cons. On this particular ship, they are targeting a young, naive snake enthusiast, named Charles Pike, who's played by Henry Fonda. Charles is the son of a wealthy beer maker. Charles is not interested in the family business and is somewhat introverted. He is very well known because of his wealthy family and all the ladies on the boat are trying to catch his eye, much to his disgust. Jean is far too clever to be that obvious and instead she trips him as he walks by and then begins yelling at him that he broke her shoe and insists that he take her up to her room to get a new pair. Charles is very apologetic and agrees to help her. Once in her room, she is very seductive with him, making him put the new shoes on her feet for her, and also cuddling with him. He is overwhelmed by her perfume and her closeness, and he is continually mentioning that he has been in the Amazon for a year, alone, without women. However, when he tries to kiss her, she just shuts him down. Jean brings him to meet her father and they begin to perpetrate their scam on him by letting him win some money in the card game. 
Charles thinks he is very good at cards, and he even shows them a card trick, which they pretend to be amazed by. However, two things are happening to thwart their plans. The first is that Charles has a bodyguard who looks after him, and he is extremely suspicious of Harry and Jean. He sets about trying to find out more about them. Secondly, Jean starts to become very fond of Charles after spending some time with him and is very charmed by him. She gets to the point that she doesn't wish to scam him or take his money, and instead she wants to marry him. She tells her father so and insists he not scam Charles. Unfortunately, the bodyguard has discovered exactly who Harry and Jean are and tells Charles. He is devastated, and when he confronts Jean, she admits to it and tells him that she loves him and still wants to marry him. But he rejects her and says something hurtful to her, which makes her hate him. She vows to get revenge. Later, Harry and Jean run into another con artist friend who is scamming people in Connecticut by pretending to be a member of British nobility. He is living right in the neighborhood of the Pike family, so Jean stays with him in the guise of being his niece, the Lady Eve. She attends a party at the Pike home and charms the entire company, especially Charles's father. When Charles joins them, he is astounded to see her and tries to keep asking her if they have met before, but Jean slash Lady Eve continues to insist they have not to the point that Charles begins to believe her. He also continually gets caught up in a series of accidents which leave him covered in various foodstuffs. The bodyguard is also there and he is not fooled at all, but by then Charles is adamant that the Lady, Lady Eve and Jean are not the same person. Eventually, Lady Eve gets Charles to propose in a highly amusing scene where Charles's horse continually nuzzles his head while he is trying to propose. They do get married, but while on the train for the honeymoon, Lady Eve invents numerous tales of other men she had been involved with prior to Charles to the point that he gets so upset and disgusted that he gets off the train and leaves her. If you want to know what happens in the end, you will have to see the Lady Eve yourself. I suggest you check your local library for a copy. If they don't have a copy there, you can ask them to check the county system, and they should be able to order a copy to be sent to the library of your choice. You will usually get it within three to four days. So, the next film I want to talk about is one of my all-time favorite films, and definitely my number one comedy or screwball comedy, 20th Century, 1934. If you have not seen this film, please do yourself a favor and get a copy of it. This film stars the queen of screwball comedies, Carol Lombard. Carol Lombard is perfectly suited to this style of film and is in several other screwball comedies. The real surprise is the serious dramatic actor John Barrymore being the other lead. Known for his great dramatic acting, Barrymore is an absolute delight in this film. He excels at playing hammy without being too over the top, and he jumps and flings himself around as if he's in his 20s, which is especially impressive, because by this time the film was being made, he was in his 50s, and he was not in especially great sh shape because of severe alcoholism. The film is further helped along by the presence of two excellent and hilarious character actors, Walter Connolly and Roscoe Carnes, who were both veterans of screwball comedies, both having been in It Happened One Night. Each actor adds his own comic flair to their role, and most specifically, Roscoe Carnes has all kinds of very witty dialogue. The film was based on a play called Napoleon of Broadway and was directed by Howard Hawks. The film revolves around the theater and a man named Oscar Jaffe, who is played by John Barrymore, who is a fam famous theater producer with numerous shows on Broadway. Oscar has a couple very devoted employees, Oliver, his bookkeeper, played by Walter Connolly, and Owen, who just seems to be sort of a personal assistant, played by Roscoe Carnes. Owen is constantly drunk throughout the entire film. In the beginning, we see a rehearsal for a new play and a lingerie model, Mildred Plotka, who has been handpicked by Oscar to star, though she has no acting experience. She is quite bad, and everyone is trying to convince Oscar to get rid of her. Oscar, however, takes it upon himself to train her and to change her name to Lily Garland and she becomes an overnight sensation. Lily and Oscar go on to collaborate both personally and professionally for several years. However, Oscar is jealous and controlling to the point of having Lily followed and tapping her phone. 
This causes frequent fighting, and she eventually runs off to Hollywood. Oscar is infuriated and replaces her with another girl in the company, hoping to have the same success. Alas, it is not to be so, and Oscar is relegated to sneaking out of town to avoid the sheriff when all his plays flop. Oscar, Owen, and Oliver board the 20th century train to try to escape town and try to find some pr production money. They run into several bizarre folks on the train, including a little man who pastes religious stickers all over everything and everyone. He turns out to be an escapee from an asylum who also has a bad habit of writing large checks that are fake. In an interesting twist, Lily Garland also boards the train with her current boyfriend. Owen and Oliver convince Oscar to try to bring her back into the fold and that she will save their theater. However, Lily is not very receptive. All sorts of craziness and antics ensue on the train and it is extremely hilarious. And did I mention the dialogue? Well, again, it's just incredibly fast paced and witty throughout. There is also a scene with both Lily and Oscar together in a train compartment, each throwing a tantrum simultaneously. It's really just priceless. I've seen this film numerous times and I still laugh every time I see this film. I can't recommend this film enough. If you are looking for a screwball comedy or just a comedy in general, you cannot go wrong with 20th Century. Hello? Sounds good, send them in. Well folks, it's time to hear what our viewers have to say. First up, we have Bob, who is joining us on Zoom from Dallas. Hi, Bob. What screwball comedy do you want to talk about today? Hi, Wendy. Well, I'm going to be talking about Ball of Fire from 1941, directed by uh, Howard Hawks and written by Billy Wilder and Charles Brackett. Okay. Uh, we become accustomed to live action remakes of Disney films over the over the past year, uh, past few years. Uh, but what if I were to tell you that the first live action remake of a Disney film wasn't done by Disney? And as a matter of fact, it was uh, done in the 40s with Gary Cooper and Barbara Stanwyck. This is Howard Hawks and Wild Billy Wilder's fanciful take on Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. <laughs> it starts in Manhattan. Professor Bertram Potts and his seven colleagues are employed by the Totten Foundation and are working on a comprehensive encyclopedia of numerous subjects. Uh, they start each day with a stroll in Central Park. They might as well be singing, hi-ho, hi-ho, it's off to work we go, and um, then go back to their, their mansion at the Totten Foundation and buckle down and get to work on the dictionary. Potts is somewhat younger than his colleagues, all of whom appear to be married to their uh, field of expertise, their specialty. Yes. And all of whom also appear to be virgins, including the one who was uh, married previously. Uh, <laughs> the marriage was never consummated. Uh, they are The house is overseen by Mrs. Bragg, who is a very, uh, very tough taskmaster and makes sure that everything goes along okay. A garbage man appears and asks the scholars for some help with a uh, quiz that he's working on. And as he starts to ask his questions, he speaks in a slang that is totally unknown to the scholars. He talks about scratch, gams, smackaroos, moolah, and yum yum. Potts, the uh, linguist, the English specialist, immediately panics because he has just finished an article on slang that includes none of these terms, and he feels he has to go out and learn more about them. Uh, his, in his quest to learn more about these slang terms, he winds up at a nightclub and makes the acquaintance of Sugar Puss O'Shea, which has got to be the greatest uh, character name ever, <laughs> played, by, played by Barbara Stanwyck. Sugar Puss's boyfriend, uh, Joe Lilac, um, is being investigated by by the police for a murder, and Sugar Puss is kind of wound up somehow tied to this. So she needs to find a place to stay. She turns up at the at the Totem Mansion and stays with uh, Potts and the Seven Scholars. Lilac pressures uh, Sugar Sugar Puss to marry him, 
because a wife can't testify against her husband. But of course, the way things go in com- comedies, um, she's not in love with, with Lilac. She's in love with uh, with with Potts. Um, so, what makes this a screwball comedy? Well, it, it hits all the road marks. There's fast fast dialogue. It's very tightly constructed. Um, it creates its own little magic world. Now, when the movie opens, there's a title card that says, Once upon a time, 1941 to be exact, there lived in a great tall forest called New York, eight men who were writing an encyclopedia. They were so wise, they knew everything. The depths of the oceans and what makes the glow worm glow and what tune Nero fiddled while Rome was burning. But there was one thing about which they knew very little, as you shall soon see. So it sets up this fairy tale world. I mean, it's set in New York, and there's no danger at all to New York. Um, there are people waving guns around, but there's never a feeling that somebody's going to get actually hurt. Um, there's a, a wonderful number in the film with Gene Krupa, who, uh, drummer Gene Krupa, who plays a tune called Drum Boogie mm. using two matches and a matchbox. And he kind of slides them around. It goes on for a couple of minutes. And then when he's ready, he strikes the matches and that's that's it. So there's a lot of magic in, in, in the film. Bob, I'm sorry. Can I ask you a quick question? I just, I, sure. can't, I can't remember. I've seen this film, but who plays the boyfriend? It's somebody significant, I think. Yes, yes. Dana Andrews. And mm. um, Dana Andrews does not look like you're does not play like you're, you we're used to seeing Dana Andrews being played. Yeah. He's he's very loose. He's very uh, Dana Andrews. You, you, you're used to being kind of strict and 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 uh, stoic. Mm. Uh, Dana Andrews plays this role very loosely, and he's actually very good in it. Um, you kind of think of Dana Andrews from like Laura, from like uh, the best years of right. our lives and stuff like that. So it's really right. interesting to see right. him in kind of a screwball comedy. I think, and another thing about it, it's perfectly cast down to the the tiniest bit player, and it's so tightly constructed. There's not a loose joke. Um, there's no plot. There's no plot holes. There's no wormholes to go down and 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 kind of uh, and kind of break the action. Um, uh, and again, it's in screwball comedy. Strange things happen at the end of the film to win back the hand of Sugar Puss, um, Potts and his uh, cohorts commandeer a garbage truck and show up at, the, at Sugar Puss's wedding uh, in a garbage truck where <laughs> Potts fights for her hand. Now, on the way to the wedding, um, Potts is reading a book on boxing, so he'll know how to defend himself. And there's a great moment where Dana Andrews swings at Gary Cooper, knocks him over, the book falls out of his hand. Gary Cooper picks up the book and tosses it because he knows that you can't go by the book anymore. The only way you're going to win the lady is to throw the book away, which which I think is uh, is is great. Uh, Cooper is really terrific. I think I think too in this, and realize that he he made this film right after he won the Academy Award for Sergeant York, mm-hmm. and that the films that he made before this were all action pictures like Bo Jest and uh, The Westerner. And um, here he plays. He's wonderful as this naive, uh, naive um, scholar. And you wouldn't think he could do it, but damn, it's very good. Uh, um, and Bob, he he plays in a couple of films with Barbara Stanwyck, kind of that almost that same sort of character, like um, Mr. Deeds. I mean, right, Dundo, right. The, the two Capra films, the two Capra films, right? Yeah. Um, but and 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 you know, again, he he's good in this, and he's. Uh, he, well, he's perfect. Everybody's perfect. Um, but nobody's more perfect than Barbara Stanwyck. No. And she, and, and she is just wonderful in this role. She's the, she's she was nominated for an Academy Award for this role. Um, she's uh, you know, very hip, very jazzy, very... Um, she gives it, it's funny, she gives everybody a nickname. Mm-hmm. And um, then she leans in, you know, hey, hey, Potsy, what are you doing? <laughs> and and she she has a way, and, and she ends each sentence with like a, a click. Hey, Potsy. And I looked at it and I said, oh my God, that's Bugs Bunny. <laughs> that's, that's, you know, as Bugs Bunny's character developed over the 40s, this has got to be one of the inspirations. Um, each of the seven professors that are, that are with Gary Cooper, uh, you know, when Disney made Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, he gave each dwarf a name and a personality. Here, each 
uh, professor has an area of expertise. And you know this is a screwball comedy because the expert on sex is S.C. Zackel. Yeah, he's he's wonderful, and I, you know, I, honestly, the 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 seven characters, the, the the seven professors, are really so cute in the film, and I, I didn't know that about Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. So thank you so much for that information, and thank You're you welcome. very much, Bob. Uh, Barbara Stanwyck was just so great in Screwball Comedies, and it's just such a fun film. Thank you for joining us today to talk about Ball of Fire. Next up, we have Christina, who is from New York and who, who is also joining us via Zoom. Hi, Christina. What film do you want to talk about today? I want to talk about the Palm Beach story. And it's so funny because Claudette Colbert started this trend in the 30s with It Happened One Night, and she ends it in 1942 with the Palm Beach story, also directed by the great Preston Sturges. From the beginning of this film, you see it's going to be a crazy, zany romp not meant to be taken seriously by the great composer Victor Young. He has this fast-paced song to the William Tell Overture that basically has somebody tied up in a closet, a crazy wedding, and then you and then the title card that says, and they lived happily ever after, then you hear a little oh, crashing thing. <laughs> and then you we can turn into basically Jerry Jeffers and her husband Tom, who are at the center of the action. They are a young couple, married five years, who are rich in love, but poor in money. And it start, the film starts with their landlord actually trying to rent their apartment out from under them because they are behind in rent. Jerry charms the one of the would-be renters, and he's, he's their plight and winds up giving her money to kind of do the back rent. This sets off Tom and sets off the whole argument about how love isn't enough, you need money. This sets off Jerry to decide she should um, marry a wealthy man who could provide her with the finer things. Mm. So, of course, Tom is objecting to this because he would like to keep her as his wife. <laughs> but Jerry, after she sneaks away, leaving him a note, and then goes aboard a train where these, this ale and quail club, these rowdy men, basically take her under their, in their cabin and say, oh, yeah, you can join us for free or whatever. But they're a very rowdy bunch. And so they start shooting up the private car they're in, nearly killing the poor bartender that's there, leading to Jerry running out of the car, going into one of the upper berths. But the train conductor and others are a little, have had it with this ale and quail club. So they actually unbuckle the train. So now Jerry is trapped <laughs> without her clothes, without any money in this upper berth. And she meets and she, while she's there, this John D. Hackensacker, who is a, now at the time, Jerry doesn't know, he's really a wealthy millionaire mm -hmm. traveling in an upper berth. So he's supposed to be loosely based, obviously, on John D. Rockefeller. Now, he becomes immediately smitten with Jerry and says, don't worry, you, I will, you know, we'll get you clothes, we'll get you this. And then there's a whole montage of him buying her these outfits and not thinking about money or price, but writing in his little book. And then at the end, when he hands the woman his card and she sees, oh, yes, sir. So then Jerry realized she's with a millionaire. So she realizes she's hit the jackpot. This is what she needs. So she tells him that she's in the process of divorcing her husband, but that he won't let her go unless she gets a whole like monetary settlement. So she's telling this because she basically wants to give the money to her husband. So he's, and so of course he's incensed that a man would do this. And it's a, basically what you said about a woman taking charge, taking control and driving the plot. Right. So now in Palm Beach, Preston Sturge is pulled in Alfred Hitchcock. And when they first arrive in Palm Beach, Apparently, there's a quick scene. If you look closely, you can see Preston Sturges there. Oh, I, I didn't notice that. I have to look for that next time. I know. It's, it's pretty cool. And so anyway, they are in there. And once in Palm Beach, they meet the delightfully droll Mary Astor. And of course, John D. Hackensacker is played by Rudy Valley, who at the time, this was actually his first major comedic role. He, before this, he'd pretty much just been a singer. But his performance in this movie actually is what led him to get in the contract with Paramount and started him on his movie career. And he also sings his big hit at the time, Good Night, Sweetheart, in this film. And his sister, 
who's a multi-married woman who basically tosses men like Kleenex. There's a great line in the film when she says, nothing's permanent in this life, darling, except Roosevelt. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, that's how she sees marriage. And uh, they say that she might be loosely based on one of Preston Sturges's ex-wives, whose name was Eleanor Hutton, and she was a wealthy heiress who was known to hang around with European aristocracy and was wooed by a prince. Oh, nice. So it's possible Princess Ventimiglia was inspired by Preston Sturges' ex-wife. It was a very short-lived marriage. It looks like they may have been married about a year or so before the marriage was actually annulled. So there's a whole backstory there. So anyway, this brother and sister are ensnared in Jerry's plot, but the new complication comes when Tom goes looking for his wife. So Jerry does not want her plan spoiled. So she tells John, this is, oh, look, she goes and says, this is my brother. So he's like, you know, why are you doing this? And he's like, She's like, listen, I'm going to get you the money because Thomas has this idea to build this incredible airport. Don't ruin this for me. And meanwhile, the princess has a crush on Tom. Yeah. So she has this little guy that's following her around who kind of wants to be with her, who's aptly named Toto because he <laughs> follows her around like a little dog. So she, meanwhile, is very smitten with Tom. So you have the brother and sister smitten with this husband and wife, but they don't know her husband and wife. So it sets the stage for a lot of hilarity. The Hayes Code, the Hayes office, had a field day with this movie. They rejected so many scripts. They were The original title of the movie was going to be, Is Marriage Necessary? And they were like, no. no. <laughs> you cannot have a movie with the title, Is Marriage Necessary? And they, they made them, like, kept going back and forth. So I think this so ties into what you were saying before about kind of, you know, thumbing their nose at the Hayes Code. I love that it has Claudette Cabuller and... Preston Sturgis, I mean, and Joel McRae plays the leading man. I mean, they were just all so funny, so fabulous in this film. Um, I actually always wanted to see, because like I said, the beginning part of the movie sets up with this woman's tied up in a closet. Then you have the wedding, and then you have twins. And I want to see the movie of that beginning part, because I feel <laughs> there could be a whole backstory there, which was really interesting. And they allude to it, but they never fully say it. But that's the point of the screwball comedy. It's meant to be fun and light and enjoyable and just turn conventions on their ear. Oh, thank, thank you so much, Christina. Preston Sturgis really wrote some of the great screwball comedies. He's a director that doesn't get enough acclaim. Thanks so much for taking the time to talk about Palm Beach Story today. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Well, folks, that's all the time we have for today. I've really enjoyed talking about screwball comedies with you and hope that viewers have enjoyed the show. And remember, if you want to be a guest on the show, you simply have to follow Wendy's Classic Corner on Facebook or email me at wendysclassiccorner at gmail.com. Until next time, this is Wendy from Wendy's Classic Corner saying so long, and here's looking at you, kid. So Why go anywhere else for classic movies?